multi-generational wealth. Create it, keep it, pass it along. I'm going to also focus in this presentation on how to simultaneously save and pay off debt and the important role that plays in creating multi-generational wealth. Wealth has less to do with income than most care to admit. Rather, it's often the result of how families manage their money from generation to generation. The key is to avoid wealth killers, financial loss, taxes, paying interest. Let's first look at financial loss. Time's recent article, Why It's Time to Retire the 401k, exposes what's happened to an entire generation now unprepared for retirement due to a stock market crash. Of course, what attracted them to the 401k or some other government qualified plan like a 403b uh, IRA was the tax deduction. I'd like to suggest that's a misnomer. I view that as a tax procrastination because we're procrastinating paying taxes today to pay them in retirement when we pull the money back out. Assuming we'll be at a lower tax bracket. But are we? All things being equal, if we were to draw out the same income in retirement, and hopefully that will happen if we save correctly, do we have the tax deductions that we have today? Most plan to have their homes paid off and the kids out of the house. So most tax deductions are gone. There's also a tremendous amount of pressure on our federal government to raise taxes. Uh, David Walker, who's the U.S. Form, the former U.S. Controller General, who served under three U.S. presidents, that's the nation's chief accountant, has observed in less than a decade our liabilities and unfunded promises went from $20 trillion to over $62 trillion. And the reality is actually worse. Those figures don't include a number of things, including uh, guaranteeing $5 trillion uh, by the Treasury to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So he sees that our taxes could actually double in the next 20 years. What will that mean for you in retirement? It makes sense to identify a solution that would minimize your taxes in retirement. The other challenge are, that we face right now as individual families is on average we are spending 34.5% of every dollar on interest. When I first heard that figure, 34.5%, I had a tough time believing that. Uh, this helped me a lot, and hopefully it'll help you as well. Look at the salary of this family, 67000 a year, saving 10% of their income. They have two debts, a house and a car. 2200 is their house payment, 1700 goes to interest. Car payment, 550 132 goes to interest. Total interest paid each year, annually, 23000 the interest paid out each year as a percentage of income, 23000 divided into 67000 which is their salary, comes to 34.5%. Now, what growth is needed to break even for their savings to match the interest paid out each year? So to figure that out, we take that interest payment of 23000 divided by their savings, and it equals 345%. Their savings would have to grow every year 345%. That's the rate of return they would have to achieve with no loss for them to break even on the monies they currently are transferring away to lenders on their interest payment. If you're like that last example and 34.5% of your money is currently going to interest and you're saving 10% of your money, are you earning a 345% return? This is the amortization schedule. This is something that banks never show you. They are required under the Truth in Lending Act to disclose what interest rate you, you're being charged and the total repaid amount and what portion is going to be interest. But they never show you the amortization schedule. Look at that first payment. Payment one, this is on a $100,000 loan, 8% interest rate, 30-year term like for a house. First payment, only $67 of this $733 payment is applied to the principal on that first month. The rest, 666, $666 is going to interest. 
they are going to pay 164% um, as a percentage of principal that they pay out over the life of the loan. 89% of all money is applied to interest during the first five years. Look at this. Over ha almost half of what they borrowed has been paid back in those first five years. But 89% of it was applied to interest. Look what happens at 11 years and four months. They paid back every dime and, and more. Over 100000 has been paid back, yet the bank says they still owe 85000 this would be a very bad time to lose your job. It would be very frustrating to know you gave every penny back to the bank, can no longer make some payments for a while, they foreclose on you, and you lose the house. Because 85% went to interest, you still have 224 payments to go. On a car, it works a similar way. Here's the amortization schedule of a car. 21% is paid out over the life of a five-year loan, 8% interest on a $10,000 loan. And it's not, it's not all paid out evenly either. Check out how stacked the interest is in the early years. 30% of um, interest paid or, or of total monies paid out, 30% is applied to interest in the first year, only 4% on the last. I've always been impressed by orchards the process of planting one, and the long-range thinking associated with it. For example, to plant an English walnut, it takes 20 years for the first nut to drop and 72 years before you can harvest the wood. Picture a 50-year-old farmer planting an English walnut grove knowing he's not going to harvest the wood during his lifespan. That's missing. That mentality, that long-range planning, it's missing in our family planning today, okay? We, as a goal, generally just want to have enough money until we die. We're not thinking about how we can create income and monies for the future generations. Yet the families who think long-range, like 150 year spans of time, they win by default every time. Let me show you why. We paid $2,165 on of interest to the bank on that car loan example. So, and we were paying 8% interest on the five-year note. Had we instead earned 8% on that same dollar amount over 150 years, that money would be $223 million. Same thing on the house. We paid $164,000 of interest it had a future value in 150 years of $16.9 billion. That is what's taking place right now. We are transferring wealth to banks or lenders. And if we could learn how to, one, keep that self-finance and then pass it along tax-free from generation to generation, we can, by default, create one of America's wealthiest families. And as you see, this is independent of income because this is a home loan, 100 k Who do you know only takes out 100 k on a house today? And look what the future value is at that interest rate. So here's the solution I suggest, a non-MEC whole life insurance policy with, and this is very important, a participating non-direct recognition issuer. This makes the ideal vehicle to avoid the three wealth killers. And I'll explain each of these terms as we go along. First, a whole life policy, just like a term policy, has a death benefit, but it also has a cash value. That cash value could be utilized, a resource for you, to finance the things you need in life today. Things like student loans, cars, real estate, business loans. It also could be a resource for you in retirement. The death benefit is guaranteed and unlike um, a term death benefit, a whole life benefit with a participating company when you use what they call dividends um, to purchase additional life insurance, paid up additions, um, it could cause that death benefit to grow. Now, when I first heard about the concept that a death benefit could grow, I thought I misunderstood it. So I want to focus on this for a minute. 
you may not realize that you could buy a whole life policy for like say a million dollars death benefit today and if you live long enough and if it continues and in, in, in the, the company does well in their dividends and they're used to buy additional life insurance that one million dollar death benefit could become eight ten million dollars a lot larger than what you bought originally okay so it can grow now what are dividends um, they're not the same although the word is the same they're not the same as they're considered when outside of uh, life insurance like with stocks dividends really are simply a return of premium for overpayment of premium it just basically means according to the IRS that the life insurance company charged you too much that year and they're giving you some of the premium money back um, tax-free transfer of wealth we have with a death benefit the ability to transfer a large sum of money to our heirs tax-free and that simply means that they do not have to pay federal income tax on those monies and level premiums what is that premiums do not rise with age in whole life one you have a what a standard flat level premium if you bought a life insurance policy for a two-year-old they would pay that same premium but when they were two all the way up into age 99 the premiums stay the same cash value cash value is like I mentioned something you can use in retirement you could use it to finance things the cash value growth is guaranteed the growth is also tax deferred and there's no loss guaranteed the, it, it provides dividend income with a participating company and dividends are, are not guaranteed but um, can become quite helpful when you're retiring and, and it, when you're using them to buy additional life insurance um, there's no tax consequence for those dividends um, and they create not only a larger death benefit but a larger cash value and of course you could access for any purpose with no surrender charges the goal to me is to raise each generation up one class level and I have seen whole life death benefits facilitate that imagine a salaried union teacher moving his posterity up one class level one level per generation with his policies death benefit and then teaching each generation to follow his example developing over time an ultra affluent family independent of income now I, I mentioned I was going to show you how you can simultaneously save and pay off debt and how you can use these whole life policies to get out of debt rather quickly let's go through an example we talked earlier about an individual who made 67,000 a year assume that same thing here and that this person has credit card debts of $7,500 a car payment of 10,000 medical 15 grand and they owe money on their home 100k okay so they purchase a whole life insurance policy on the left and as you see on the bottom highlighted is 71,858 that's how much money they put in to the policy through it's not really saving it's they're just simply buying paying premiums but um, we'll think of it as savings for this purpose of the discussion they are they put in 71,000 over 11 years it creates a cash value that's available to them of ninety one thousand seven hundred and thirty six dollars so there's twenty thousand more available than what they put in on the right you see their listing of debts um, highlighted is hundred and thirty two thousand five hundred that's their total debt obligation and next to that nineteen thousand six hundred and eighty eight that's the annual pay that's the in total annually that they're spending to service that debt what I want to show you is how we can use this whole life insurance policies cash value to pay off all their debts so we got 71,000 over there that we're putting in and we're going to use some of that money to pay off the 132,000 obligation let me show you what I'm about ready to, this is going to you find this quite interesting using the money on the left we're going to actually pay off all the money on the right that doesn't seem possible but but understand we got two rules we can use any and all of the cash value of that 91,000 and we can use the same payments that we're making anyway that 19,688 so this is a way that we save and pay off debt simultaneously um, before I begin I want to hi highlight a couple things to you 
please note that you'll see that there's more going in during those first four years of premium, the 12000 figure, which is about 18% of this person's money, than there is afterwards. They're only putting about 4% thereafter. They're doing this to take advantage of um, what the government allows us to put into the policy in relation to the death benefit and go up to what's called a MEC line. Remember I said it needs to be a non-MEC whole life insurance policy? The MEC line is the line, if you stay below the line, um, it retains its favorable tax treatment associated with whole life. If you go over that line, well, you don't have the favorable tax treatments any longer. So it's very important that um, it, it's very optimal for a client, generally speaking, to be up to that MEC line but not past it. Insurance companies produce software for agents that allow us to, to learn where that line is and to maximize that cash value for a client. And that's what's going on here. Okay, the first thing we do is we take out a policy loan of $7,500 and pay off all credit cards. And the $4,800 that we were making as payments each year to our credit cards, we're now going to use to repay the policy loan. Please note that uh, there is a loan rate of 6% here. In whole life companies do charge you interest when you take out policy loans. That's very important to understand. So why would we do it? Well, one good reason would be to pay off higher interest rate items, like a credit card that charges 18% in this example. The other thing to note is the cash value does grow in somewhat of a corresponding relationship with the interest rate charged. At least that's an observation. It's, it's difficult to make some statements here about um, how this works because different companies um, will or well, they just simply operate differently and have different rules. For example, I know of a company that charges, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. They have what's called a wash loan. The interest rate charged is exactly the cash value growth. Others, they try to get a 1% margin on you. While others, it could work out, it floats a little bit and it could work out in your interest. But generally speaking, um, the interest rate that you're charged, you will see a corresponding growth in your cash value. On the next year, um, we take out 10000 and pay off the car and use that same payment we were making towards the car and the, and the credit cards. We're making those now back into the whole life policy. On year three, we take out 15000 out of the insurance policy and we're going to pay off the medical expenses and apply those exact same payments we were making. We're now making them back into our whole life policy. So instead of paying uh, a lender all that money, we're now it's now being reflected back into our own policy. Years four through eight, we take out ten thousand each year and apply that towards the house loan. And year nine, we take out fifty thousand and we pay off the house. Okay, so what what's interesting here is we've now paid off all of our debts. We still owe our policy some money but we paid off all of our outside debt in nine years. We then continue to make those payments of $19,688 for the next two years. Um, and a little less the final year, year 11, everything is paid back into our account. All policy loans have been repaid. All outside debts have been repaid. So now look at the totals on the bottom. Under cash value, you see $91,736. That's to the penny the exact amount it would have been had we not used this policy to pay off debt. So by using it to, say, to save and pay off debt simultaneously, we have not fouled up in any way our retirement. We've grown at the same pace. Why? Because we are using, for this example, a non-direct recognition whole life insurance company. Remember I said that we needed to use a company that's non-direct recognition. There's direct recognition. Those are companies that will pay out dividends to you based upon your cash value. And then there's um, non-direct recognition companies that will pay you the same dividend regardless of what your cash value account is showing. In other words, if you have an outstanding policy loan, that won't foul up what they pay you in dividends. They pay you the same. 
so your count grows the same as if you never touched it. Now that is very powerful. The ability to save and pay off debt simultaneously, and so long as you repay the policy loans, places you back in the exact same position that you would have been had you never touched it. Try to get that deal with your 401k or your mutual fund or any other any other source that I'm aware of out there for saving for retirement. This is very powerful. When I show others what I just showed you, many ask, is this too good to be true? Let's do a reality check. First off, these companies have existed since the Civil War era, over 140 years. They have an A excellent rating with AM Best, but perhaps most important, no one lost money with them ever. When you look at the other options, how do they measure up um, on concepts of avoiding wealth killers? So let's look at the 401k, RA, mutual funds, bonds, private investments, anything that, that you may also be considering or using to aggregate wealth for retirement and pass it along to the next generation. How do they address issues like financial loss? Is your money at risk? Can you lose your money? Second, taxes. How does it treat your income in retirement? Okay, um, do they to the minimize taxes or are you going to bear the full brunt of taxes in retirement? And third, paying interest. Does it allow you to take monies out um, and uh, to pay off higher interest rate items today? Can you save and simultaneously pay off debt? We saw with the Time article what happens when an entire generation puts all of its money up at risk. We understand that taxes are very likely to go up. And we've seen what kind of return you need to get if you're spending 34.5% of every dollar on interest and you're saving 10% of your money to just to break even. When looking at whole life, which is also known as permanent insurance, um, it does avoid the three wealth killers. On the concept of financial loss, there is no loss guaranteed. On taxes, the, it's tax deferred growth. You can take money out tax free and the death benefit is passed along tax free to the next generation. And um, on the concept of paying interest, you can save and pay off debt simultaneously. To me, this is the most important benefit of them all, and that is that your policy grows the same, even if you become disabled and can't fund it. Now, this assumes and requires that you, that you purchase a waiver of premium disability rider at the time that you purchase your whole life policy. But what this means is if you become disabled, the it will waive your responsibility to make premium payments so that you can count on the same retirement that you planned on in the event of disability and you can count on passing along that sum of money to your heirs tax-free that you planned on disability won't stop that now consider the alternative let's say you were placing money into an IRA or some other retirement vehicle and and let's say you're 45 years old and you've been doing that for 20 years but you still have another 20 years to go. Now you may have a disability um, a policy of some kind to cover maybe making your mortgage payment or to cover some of the basic necessities of life in the event you become disabled, but could you continue to fund your retirement? Um, likely you couldn't. So what would retirement look like for you in that situation? This is the power of this approach. When we talk about guarantees, and we talk about insuring against financial loss, or insuring a retirement, this is the power of this approach.